Welcome to Transform and Transformational, a Teach Beyond podcast. I'm Kian. And I'm Heather. We're here to explore what it means to be transformed in our own lives and how that overflows to living lives of transformational impact in our communities. We are talking about stories today. And over the last four seasons, if you're a regular listener, you have heard (laughs) us bring up books and our love of the library quite a bit. (laughs) That's true. I remember mentioning, you know, putting holds on books at the library. This has definitely been a topic we've brought up before. (laughs) Yeah. I didn't realize how much my family loved the library until very recently when I hit the checkout limit on my library card. (laughs) And apparently there is one. I didn't know. (laughs) Yeah. I had to ask a librarian, how many are you limited to? And she said 50, which means (laughs) I had 50 on my library card, but then my wife's library card and the kids have library cards. So we had so many books. (laughs) (laughs) That is crazy. I feel like for most people, reading 50 books in a whole year would be impressive. Although I guess if you have kids books mixed in there, that is easy to do. (laughs) Yeah, I think in all 50, there was maybe three adult books total. So it wasn't that that impressive as far as reading goes. Our guest today is Tosca Nathan, Teach Beyond's Regional Vice President for East Asia and Oceania. Tosca lives with her husband, Peter, and two young adult children on the Gold Coast in Queensland, Australia. Tosca has been involved in missions for over 20 years, and while she has had various roles, she finds herself returning time and time again to educational ministry and has newly joined the Teach Beyond team. Prior to serving with Teach Beyond, Tosca has worked in every sector of education, early learning, K-12 education, vocational ed, and higher education. She holds postgraduate degrees in communications, theological studies, teaching and learning, and education leadership. Tosca has conducted research on faith and teaching, exploring teachers' narratives and what these stories reveal about the connection between teacher identity and practice. And that is the topic of our conversation today. Let's go over to that conversation with Tosca now. Welcome to the podcast, Tosca. Thank you. Very glad to be here. We are so excited to have you here for this podcast and having this conversation. And as this is an episode about stories, I'm curious about who your favorite book character is. And this isn't your favorite book or the book you reread the most, but just a character you really love and you've come to know. I think I'd have to say that would be Gandalf in the Lord of the Rings trilogy. And not just because he's got all the whiz bangs, you know, all the wizardry Mm -hmm. stuff and the magic and but I love the way he really presses into people. It's very clear that he's built so many relationships around him that just helps him along the journey, but he mm. believes in people. But I also love the fact that he's always looking to the bigger picture and nothing that he does is separated from the bigger picture. So I just mm. love the wisdom that comes out of him and, and how all that wisdom has been built over time. Mm-hmm. That's great. I love that you chose Gandalf and not, you know, Sam or Frodo, but obviously a pinnacle character in that story. Um, as we're talking today about how we see our lives as stories, can you tell us about what the significance of stories are to us as individuals and to us as a community as a whole? Sure. Stories are such a basic form of communication. We almost ignore them. Because, you know, on a daily basis, we tell stories. And stories are, are so basic to who we are and what we do as societies. Uh, in fact, the interest in narrative is, goes way back. And, you know, the, the idea that we live storied lives is rich and everybody understands it. They relate to it. But it's really more than just that our, our stories, our lives can be told as stories. So uh, Ben Okri, who is a, an African novelist, he says, we live by stories, we also live in them. And another author, Jonathan Gottschall, who wrote um, The Storytelling Animal, he says, our life stories are who we are. They are our identity, which is another level of understanding how stories play a part in our lives. That's so interesting to think about our lives as stories. What makes up our story? How do we think about it, attend to it, and just think process through our life as a story. Yeah, sure. You know, there is a a whole field of psychology uh, that works around the idea of a narrative identity. And so the significance of story, uh, before I go into what actually makes up our life story, is that we, we have storied lives and the questions, who am I 
and what is my purpose come out of that story and are actually expressed as those stories. So what stories are we talking about? I mean, we're not talking about your daily anecdotes about how I forgot my coffee cup on the, or my mug on top of my car and I drove off and it's <laughs> all over the place. Those are interesting and fun and they make up part of everyday living. But what we're really after here is the life story. And mm-hmm. like any story, our life stories have a path. They have a trajectory and it's full of meaningful events, defining moments, key relationships, trials and disappointments, dreams and aspirations, passions and discoveries. Just like when you read a novel, the character development is all about these things and the things that they go through and not just the events, but how they react to the events. So the same goes for our life stories. We don't pay attention enough, I think, to our life stories. Um, And I have a small anecdote to share about this Mm -hmm. Uh, because our life stories are ours. We are really the experts in our life stories, but many authors have commented that we have lost not just the appreciation of our life stories, but the ability to tell our life stories. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've been around to a lot of places encouraging people to tell their life stories Mm. And it's funny when you give people the opportunity and in fact, make it a task for them to tell a story or their life stories. It's almost like a whole floodgate opens and they're (laughs) so excited to tell their stories almost to the point of panic. You know, we were once in a, in a meeting online when they had to go into breakout rooms to tell their stories. And one person was like, I can't get into my breakout room. Please somebody help me. Because she was so eager to hear the stories and tell the stories. That's so interesting. I think the idea of telling your story, I think we all know people who love talking about themselves and sharing their story. And then there's people who maybe feel like I shouldn't be talking about myself so much. Maybe it feels like mm-hmm. self-centered to be so focused on your own story and constantly telling your story. But mm-hmm. how do we think about our stories from a, a biblical point, point of view in telling our stories, how God would see them versus maybe feeling self-centered like you're just talking about yourself. Timothy Keller says this, everyone operates, lives and operates out of some narrative identity, whether it is thought out and reflected upon or not. So before I answer your question about how to attend to it biblically, let's talk about why it's important to tell your story. And it's around this idea of narrative identity. When you tell a story, you are essentially, or your life story, you are essentially living who you are. And this is the concept when you talk about narrative coaching. It's people saying, let's take a look at the narrative that you're living out of because it's affecting how you view the world, how you move along in the in your story, and how you view other people. So one of the very key functions of narrative identity is in enabling you to answer those two questions. Who am I and what is my purpose? And one of the key concepts in narrative identity that I really, really love is the idea of coherence in your life story. Now, if you're a writer and you know you would have done this through your high school, when you write an essay, you are always, it's always evaluated on the basis of coherence. And coherence simply means that whatever it is you're saying is well understood, not just to yourself, but to your listeners. And coherence in life stories can actually be expressed in different ways. By the way, coherence has been correlated to well-being. How coherent your life story is and how coherently you can talk about your life story has been uh, seen as a factor in well-being. So coherence, there are different ways to approach that. You can have a coherence of time. What that means is that you can see how your past has shaped your present and how your present helps you imagine possibilities for the future. So that's coherence of time. You also have a coherence of uh, 
a thematic coherence, let's put it that way. And the idea with thematic coherence is that you look at your life story and you can trace a thread running through your story. The last one is contextual coherence, and that's probably the hardest. And I have found just in talking to people about their stories that that is not the automatic way that they attend to coherence. And contextual coherence is the idea that your life story never exists in a vacuum. It is always part and parcel of a bigger story. In, in this case, it could be the story of your family, the story of your community, it could be the, the story of your culture. But then there's a bigger story even, and that is the story of God. And often, people don't attend to that contextual. They do it subconsciously, but there is such a power in articulating the contextual coherence of one's life story. So, Kian, you asked, how do we keep from, uh, in, in an effort to tell our life stories, because it is important, how do we keep from making it a self-centered enterprise, right? Uh, funnily enough, if you research stories, uh, there are countless memes and slogans and you know beautiful visuals that accompany this idea of story. It's become, in our day, a, a very lucrative motivational platform or a advertising promotional platform. It's what's your story? That's the tagline, right? And with that come all the slogans like you be you and be true to yourself, find yourself and then express it. And that, that is so um, prevalent in media, in our movies. Every Disney movie has that theme of finding yourself and then discovering and then doing something grand with that discovery. And we lap it up because there is something that is so relevant to us when somebody says you're significant, there is worth to your life. This is something that all of us want to hear. And that's actually a phenomenon. Um, I don't know the exact word to use it, but it's been identified by many sociologists, uh, philosophers in our day, and it's called expressive individualism. And in many ways, there is value to to saying everybody has worth. You know, Ryan talked about this idea of authenticity in the episode that he did a few weeks ago. Well, expressive individualism encourages authenticity, encourages you to be real and not pretentious. But where the problem lies, and, and this is the concern I have, is that it's so normal now in our day to hear all these things that we don't, it's so normalized that we don't even think to really delve into it. The problem with expressive individualism is for all the value that it brings to individuals, it falls short of answering the question, who am I and what is my purpose? Because expressive individualism is based upon a lot of times how I feel. And Brian's already touched on, you know, how dangerous that is. But expressive individualism, if all you're doing is looking at your own story and then saying, how do I want to, what do I want to make of this? One, can you imagine the pressure of having to create your own life and make something of yourself and create your own purpose? So in that sense, expressive individualism falls short because you end up with a self-defined identity and a self-determined purpose. You contrast that with the biblical view of your story. And it's, it's really interesting because when I started doing these workshops, it was actually a fear of mine that I was going to lead people down the wrong track and, and lead them down the track of being so self-centered that they've forgotten that the point of looking at yourself is much bigger than just mm. self-fulfillment, right? And so I was almost in tears when I discovered this idea of expressive individualism. If you think about Jesus, and he's always a good example to come to because we not only is he Lord, 
for us, but we do look at his life and try to emulate some of the things that he does. Jesus was human. He was born human, right? But his life story evolved um, through people, through what he learned in scripture, all of that. So by by the time he was ministering, one could say that Jesus was completely in the know about who he was and his purpose. I mean, that's very clear in scripture. And often he would exercise that coherence, you know, coherence of time. He would look back what was said about the Messiah. There's coherence of a thread. I have come to give you life. He understood all of that. There's coherence of contextual, the contextual type, because he was always relating who he was to who God was. And what, there are many examples in, in the Gospels uh, expressing how Jesus understood and practiced his life story and telling a coherent life story. But the one that I love, and I often use this, the verse starts out like this. Jesus, knowing that all authority had been given into his hands, knowing where he had come from and where he was going to, he dot, dot, dot. Do you guys know what comes after? First of all, do you agree with me that that is an identity statement? Yeah. Is that when he went into the desert? Nope. He did something. What did he do? The verse goes, so he got up, took the towel, wrapped it around himself, and washed the disciples' feet. Yes. And that is really the biblical way of looking at your story because our stories are not an end unto itself. Mm. Our story is always in the context of how God has made us and what he has made us for. And in that way, it's not an autobiography, but what I call a theobiography. It's Mm -hmm. God authored. And so my self-worth and my identity is God defined, Christ defined, because our identity is in Christ and our purpose is God determined. And it's powerful when you understand that your story is connected to God's story by design. It's not only freeing, it has a way of so embracing your self-worth as a starting point that sky's the limit. It opens up so many doors of possibilities. It's not short-sighted, it's long-term. It's not self-focused, it's other-focused. But to draw significance from that, There is nothing more significant than knowing that God created you for a purpose and he sees you and knows you. So that's the difference between expressive individualism and self-centered life stories versus a story that's connected to God. That's beautiful. And I love one of the questions I was going to ask you before when you were talking about the different themes of coherence, time, theme, and contextual was If somebody looks back at their life and sees a common thread of something like rejection or failure or things like that, how do you kind of cope with that or like help someone like deal with that? And I think you kind of answered that question in what you just said about how you see it in a larger biblical view of how God views you. Um, That's just really beautiful. Right. Coherence we do automatically. Mm -hmm. Um, So we don't actually see how it, it works, but You know, even if there is a thread of rejection there, the minute you apply then contextual coherence, you realize, well, that's not of God and God can redeem that so that the the thread then becomes the redemption from that, you see? So all these these types of coherences, it's funny because we don't act, it's not an act of coherence, (laughs) but it is a way that we try to understand things. And the more we tell our story, By the way, in the Bible, uh, there's only one place where the word story is so explicitly stated, and that's in Psalms, where it says, tell your story. Let the redeemed Mm -hmm. of the Lord tell their story. Mm -hmm. And one of the aspects of storytelling or telling your life story that's come out is that in the telling itself, every time you tell it, there's more meaning making that happens. So it's important to tell your story. And that's what I go around doing. I 
encourage people. And sometimes they go, you really want to hear my life story? I'm like, yes, yes, because it's so important. Let's take a short break for a story from the field. I'm Amanda Cameron, and I'm the recruiting coordinator and mobilization coach for our Canada US team. When I think about stories and God writing our stories, I think about my own story, which is full of twists and turns and things not going as I had planned. But thankfully, God was writing my story. After Teachers College, I was called to work in my home church as a youth pastor. This was not the teaching position I thought I was going to have when I graduated, but it was an awesome experience to work with the youth and encourage them to grow in their faith. I ended up getting married later in life than I was expecting, becoming a wife and mother on the same day, since my husband had previously lost his wife and he had three small children. We lived in Europe for a couple years where our fourth child was born, and while we were there, I was robbed one evening while I was driving to a meeting. Thankfully, God's hand kept me safe, and only my purse was stolen. We came back to Canada where I taught private piano lessons and music part-time at a local Christian school. During this time, there was a medical concern with our son, with my mom, and I was also hospitalized for a couple of weeks with complications after a surgery. When I was 14, God gave me a desire to teach in Africa, and I wasn't sure when that would happen or what that would look like. But in 2018, God opened the door for my husband and I to teach at a Christian school in Jos, Nigeria. We stayed for four years, and I taught middle school Bible and music. In 2022, my husband's mom passed away suddenly, and a month later, my mom also passed away after a long battle with cancer. And it was time for our family to transition back to Canada. I began my role as recruiting coordinator and mobilization coach after we moved back. In those moments of twists and turns, ups and downs, I didn't necessarily see the big picture or understand all that was happening. But now, looking back at where I've been, I can see how God was working out all the details as he wrote my story and how he has been walking beside me each and every day. When I was in Nigeria, I knew that my students all have their own stories, and many times they would take time to share with me their joys and struggles and challenges, their twists and turns. And I felt privileged to walk beside them during those times, to encourage them, share God's word with them, pointing them to Jesus as the author of their story and helping them to grow in their faith. I believe that our stories are meant to be shared, to encourage and help each other, and most importantly, to give the glory to God. For our weekly spotlight, we are focusing on lingo, English as outreach. There are many ways to serve using English, from short-term trips to part-time and full-time positions, in the classroom of a school or language center, or at an English camp. You can even teach virtually with Lingo Online. To learn more about serving with Lingo, visit teachbeyond.org go, or click on the link in the show notes. And now back to our conversation with Tosca. Well, Tosca, I know that part of the um, perspective that you bring to talking about story has to do with teachers and educators knowing their stories. So can you talk to us about how all of this information about story relates to teaching? How does that shape the classroom, the lessons? And, you know, we know how we've talked about how that shapes us as people, but how does that carry over into our work and into our classrooms? It's a great question. And um, perhaps the journey that I took as a researcher into stories can answer that because one of the people that's affected me a lot is uh, Parker Palmer, who is known in Christian education circles for his books that deal with the inner life of a teacher. And he says this, Good teaching cannot be reduced to technique. Good teaching comes from the identity and integrity of the teacher. And integrity here doesn't mean, you know, the character integrity. The idea is the integrality, meaning the wholeness of a teacher. So he's observed that often teachers will ask what? What do we teach? If you go a little bit deeper, they might ask how? How do we teach it? What's the pedagogy? 
If they go deeper still, they will ask why. But Parker Palmer says this in his book that uh, very, very seldom do teachers ask who. Who is the self that teaches? And I'm, I'm quoting him now. Who is the self that teaches? How does, my, how does the quality of my selfhood form or deform the way I relate to my students, my subject, my colleagues, and my world? And here's, here's the clincher. He says, it doesn't matter who we teach or what we teach. At the end of the day, we teach who we are. So this is how it ties to story. Because if teachers are not fully aware of who they are and have exercised all the, the areas of coherence, they will not be as effective in their teaching as they could possibly be if they understood, one, how their past has brought them to this place, how, how God has shaped them with, with threads of continuity in their lives for this role that they now have, and, second, and thirdly, how their teaching even relates to the grand story of God. Without those elements, you can see that you might be able to teach, but you'd only go so far. But with all the elements of life story and coherence, sky's the limit as to the things that you can do and the ways that you can relate to your students. Yeah, I love hearing you talk about how this integrates into the classroom. That is, it's so helpful to think about who we are entering the classroom. And yet we do just dive into the what and the practicality and miss the self-reflection and the time to attend to our story, as you were saying before, what would you say, um, you know, we talk about transformation a lot around here because of our title transformed and transformational. What is, what does it look like to teach out of transformation? And can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. And I, I've seen this happen often as, as they're telling their stories, the transformation is happening in, in a revelation that somehow they missed in, in all their lives of knowing their own stories. One of the, th the key things that looking at stories has taught me is the potential for impacting people by just helping them attend to their stories. And many students will name a teacher who they're impacted by, not because of the knowledge, although there are some teachers who, you know, have a, a gift of expressing the knowledge. But one of the ways that they're impacted the most is when the teacher, with what they do or how they relate, helps the student understand how their story connects to bigger things. So if you are, as a teacher, trying to help your student remember that their story is part of a bigger story and all the aspects of coherence that their stories are important for all the reasons that we talked about. It is nigh on impossible to do that for a student if you yourself don't have a concept of how your story connects to the bigger picture. Because you will stop with, well, you need to know this, this, and this for the exam, and I've done my job, right? You need this, this, and this to pass to get to university. I've done my job. So because it's so inherent in what you, who you are as a teacher that you are constantly working with lives, you cannot operate in that realm without you yourself having experienced it. it it's simple mathematics. You, don't, you can't give what you don't have. So in that way, I love the idea of teaching for transformation from transformation. Mm -hmm. I love the way you describe that. It's not, this isn't just for the teacher attending their story. It's for the teacher then being able to teach the student and realizing the students all have their own stories that they're living in. Oh, that's true. Can you share ex examples of how that has kind of played out as the teacher has been able to attend to their story, and then in the classroom, how that might relate to the students. I'll give you an example of one of the, the teachers who was so kind to help me with my research. So she was talking to me about uh, 
having been through a non-traditional trajectory prior to going into traditional trajectory. And what she meant by non-traditional was that when she got certified as a teacher, she went into uh, vocational ed, various areas of vocational education. So she considered that non-traditional. But then later on in the story, she was telling me that she actually struggles to be intentional about all the things we consider part of schooling, (laughs) meaning things like, you know, wear the right uniform. There are certain times during the day that you have to be there and all the things that become part of the form of schooling in the traditional setting, like a normal K to 12. So when she was talking, she was telling me about this this situation where uh, a student who who had a very difficult family life made it to school one day with a hodgepodge of uniform items. It was, you know, maybe a PE shirt with the formal skirt. Or <laughs> I don't know what it was, or, or mismatched socks with the PE socks with the formal socks. And she was walking down the hallway and she saw an interaction. The staff were, were saying, you know, very kindly, but the uniform is off kilter, <laughs> not in keeping with the uniform policy for the day. And she stepped right in and she said to this student, I don't really care about your uniform. I am just so glad you're here. And this is what she said. To be the teacher that God, sorry, this is the teacher talking now. To be the teacher that God has created me to be and the person that I need to be for the students that he's put in front of me, I needed to take a different trajectory to get here. And then she also said, my experience of my non-traditional teaching life has created this foundation for me that I'm never going to be able to separate myself from. And there's a revelation. So even as she's telling the story, she's like, oh, I just didn't realize. So the transformation was not right at that moment. The transformation had happened over time through her experience, but the realization of how God had actually shaped her and the reason why she's this kind of a teacher was precisely because of understanding her story. So transformed, she was transformed, but you see the transformation then extended to how she was as a teacher to this student who needed that kind of advocacy at that point in time. What about for you, Tosca? How have you, looking back, how have you seen and experienced personal transformation through your time as an educator? It's a very interesting question, and I must admit that I had to take some time to really reflect on that. And you'd think, you know, for all my encouraging people to look at their story, (laughs) I've looked at my story at a different angle. But when you talked about this Uh, I really had to think, but it didn't take very long for me to realize, yeah, God has done something incredible. Um, Recently, I was asked to write a paper on the theological foundations of research. And in grappling with how exactly do I present that? Do I give propositions that are theological and related to research? So I went through a, a it was a very trying time because I was trying to write this article intelligently, but authentically. And I came out the other end with such an appreciation for the role of scholarship, which includes research, teaching, and learning, that I will never approach research the same way again. And and the idea there is I've come to understand that scholarship has a purpose in the grand story of God. And that is, in my mind, Uh, discovering or what an author uh, has called an unhiding, unhiding of God's truth and God's knowledge. And knowledge, of course, begins with God and it's all God's, right? So scholarship is a discovering and unhiding of that knowledge and then finding a way to then express that to people. And I've come to realize that that whole enterprise of unhiding, then expressing and sharing is connected to God, God's story of constantly wanting to make himself known and to get connected to people. 
It's part of his grand story. And so to realize that scholarship is part of that grand story completely changes why I even engage in research or why I engage in teaching and learning. And then on top of that, it elevates it to the level of worship. And so when I'm having a bad day, when I was having a bad day finishing that that paper or any other paper that I was writing, I would stop and go, Lord, how am I going to worship you right now? What is the attitude I need to take? So that has completely transformed why I even would do this podcast. It's certainly not so that I can hear my my own self talking (laughs) because it's not worth the while to, to do all this work for that end. It's just not worth it. But when you connect it to what God is doing and how God is working in people's lives, goodness, you couldn't find anything more fulfilling. I love that. And that is certainly true. And we have loved being able to have you on and to hear you sharing these truths and the ways to look at our story and attend to our stories in the grand narrative of of God's story. Thank you so much for what you've shared. Uh, And before we let you go, though, we have one final question we like to ask all of our guests. And that's, what's one thing that's changing your life uh, right now, this week? And it can be certainly something big in the in your grand narrative, your grand story, or something small that's just changing your life this week. Um, I'll go first, so, I, so you have a little bit of time to think about it, and then Heather will go. Um, but what's changing my life this week, this is probably a smaller thing, but it's definitely changing my life, and it's the game of Sorry. Uh, my youngest uh-huh. son discovered the game Sorry recently, and he has loved it, and we have been playing it kind of nonstop for the last <laughs> week and a half. So hopefully it doesn't change my life for too much longer, but right now it's been a very consistent <laughs> presence in my life. So. Uh, that's awesome. Some quality time with him. Yes. That's great. Um, mine's also a small, we've been having a pattern of some smaller things lately, but small things sometimes can have a big difference. Um, what's been changing my life lately is that there's little reaction buttons on emails. So instead of just reacting to like, chats or texts, I can actually give a thumbs up or a heart or a laughing face to an email. And I don't have to actually formulate a long response back when it just kind of is, it's like a quick way to respond. And um, I am aware that that sends an email to the other person. So it's not like you don't want to overuse it, but it is nice when all that is needed is a like quick response to something. So that's something that's changing my life this week. What about you, Tasca? I love that, Heather. And you're, and you're right. It has the potential to change, even simply acknowledging, right? So I really love that. And I love how you pay, both pay attention to the little things as <laughs> having an impact on you because that's important. And that's important to keep your awe and wonder uh, alive. Um, perhaps because I'm not with you guys every week, my brain <laughs> immediately went to bigger things. Sure. And yet they impact me on a daily basis. And I've been noticing uh, how that impacts me. Is it okay if I share two things? Because Oh, yes, we'll allow it. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you. So one of the things is uh, I'm starting to read, well, I started at the beginning of the year to read the Bible through, but this time paying attention to the grand story Mm. and looking for Jesus in every book of the Bible that I read and and every reading um, chunk that I go through. So that's been really rich, and I, I've appreciated so much keeping the story front and center mm-hmm. um, and seeing how Jesus is all part of it. The second thing that I'm doing that impacts me on a daily basis because I just love to do it and, and often makes me realize things about myself, uh, which I hadn't started out to do, is uh, watercolor painting. So mm-hmm. because my husband is always encouraging me to have a creative outlet, knowing that that is life-giving for me. I've picked up watercolors and didn't realize that it was going to become a metaphor for life and ministry for me (laughs) because the Lord is teaching me through the watercolors, one, to attend to light. Mm -hmm. Where is the light shining through and where can I reflect the light? So always looking for him in the different aspects of even what might be called mundane living. But secondly, is also allowing the watercolors to do what they do best. And that is, they they come out the best when they are allowed to interact with water and the, the paper and not restricted to coloring in within the lines, which yeah. my disposition is to immediately control my surroundings 
Um, so there's a lot of freedom that I'm experiencing in just seeing the beauty that comes out of letting go. Mm. So yeah, that maybe that's a little bit too, too airy fairy, no. but it's really impacting the way I view things. And I am so appreciative to have mm. stress relief at the same time, transformation of the inner self <laughs> happening. That's beautiful. And to be able to do something with your hands, do something artistic with beauty, but then also to have that picture of what you're experiencing and, you know, transformation and growth is, that's just great that it's all tying together. So absolutely. So So I have a, a painting area not very far from where my desk is because if I have 15 minutes and I just need to do a little bit of a spot here I will do it you know 15 minutes well that's great (laughs) (laughs) well Tosca thank you so much for joining us and for sharing just a little bit of your research of your thoughts on this um your heart for people knowing the value of not only their story for the story's sake, but also how there's how they see themselves in this bigger story. I mean, God's story. And so thank you for living that out and for sharing from that today. Oh, it was such a, a joy to be asked. Thank you for the privilege of doing that. Um, and I do pray that people start attending to their stories and seeing mm-hmm. how God has, has authored their stories and continues to author their stories. Kia and Tosca and I serve with an organization called Teach Beyond. As you have heard, education plays a big role in missions, and Teach Beyond is a part of that. As followers of Jesus, Teach Beyond is a global community providing transformational education services as part of God's ongoing mission to transform individuals and communities into all he intends. Want to learn more and get involved? Visit teachbeyond.org or follow us on social media. To help more people find the podcast and hear about Teach Beyond, we'd love it if you would leave a rating or review and share the show with a friend. Be sure you're subscribed or following the show on the platform where you listen so you never miss an episode. And as always, you can reach us at podcast at teachbeyond.org. We'll see you next week. The mystery word for this week is movement.